Spotify isn't the app you think it is. You see, there's been a ton of apps and websites that stream music way before Spotify. Napster, Grooveshark, Pandora, Deezer. And yet all these companies are either struggling to stay afloat, defunct, or destroyed by lawsuits. Because simply put, the business model of streaming music for free isn't really profitable or in most cases even legal. I mean, Napster was literally the prototype for Spotify. It was the same service and the same idea. And yet in just three years, Napster went bankrupt with $10 million in debt. But some I like the um, the informative part of these videos. I'll probably just skip whenever he does the, the BlackRock shit. Spotify comes out on top, raking in over $10 billion in 2021 alone. So how can Spotify possibly be making this much money? How can streaming music that's owned by record labels with limited ads and being forced to pay 30% of all its revenue to its biggest competitor, Apple, still be standing so strong? Why didn't Spotify collapse like Napster? Well, then trying to answer these questions, I fell down a rabbit hole. Corruption, military AI technology, emotional manipulation, and censorship. You see, the story of Spotify goes far beyond music alone. So to understand how Spotify truly makes its money, let's head back to where it all started. For such a huge presence, Spotify was founded quite late into the history of streaming and downloading music. Lots Tim, of competitors Tim. came before Today's it. Today's card that came. We have, we have, you ready for the words? Write them down. Um, manipulation, manipulation, <clears throat> BlackRock, censorship, China, government. Five keywords. For it and failed to succeed. The difference with Spotify was its founder, Daniel Ek. Daniel was, in all senses of the word, a business prodigy. While everyone else's age was still playing Mario 64, Daniel was building a business. At just 13 years old, Daniel had started his first business of many as a web designer. His contract started at $100, but they quickly grew in size until he was charging $5,000 per website. Daniel even hired other kids, bribing them with video games as they worked on his websites in the school computer room. And then just five years later, at the age of 18 and that was at making $50,000 a month huh? and had a team of 25 people under him. Huh? After working on various companies such as eBay, Daniel Ek would soon settle as the founder of an advertising company. This too was then sold in 2006, leaving Daniel a millionaire by his early 20s. This rocketing career had put Dan in contact with lots of powerful people. People who had been Sorry. early 20s. This rock Who is that? career had put Dan in contact with lots of powerful people, people who would be the heralds of a new golden age for tech startups. For example, Daniel had made contacts with the founder of uTorrent, a man named Ludwig. Ludwig would later work as one of Daniel's lead developers. It was these sorts of connections that would be a huge asset to Daniel, assets that were invaluable for his most ambitious project yet, Spotify. Like I mentioned, the idea for Spotify wasn't new. There had been lots of music streaming and downloading services before. The most prominent of these, and the one which gave the most inspiration for Eck, was Napster. Now, Napster wasn't particularly polished or even very user-friendly, but the greatness of Napster was that it gave its users unlimited free access to a vast range of music. People loved what they could discover through the platform. It was for this reason that it exploded in popularity shortly after its founding. However, the chat, trouble for Napster- Chat, chat, sure can relate it. Yeah, this really good song, a brand new song that came out, and it had a bunch of download links and you, you just went, you just went and said, dude, listen, get it. Guys, I have to take a risk. The song is too good. I have to take a risk. And you, you doubt it and you get fucking smoked with a fucking key locker, dude. Bald at 20 ohm is exactly that. It was free. Bald at 20 it's emphasis on pit to pit sharing made the platform perfect for shared pirated music. Napster's short life was marked by both a massive influx of users, but also massive amounts of lawsuits. The troubles for Napster began when Metallica happened to hear a song that they had made being played on someone's car radio, and yet they hadn't actually released the song. Through some snooping, they found out that a demo of the track had been leaked on Napster and was circulating across the internet. As well as all their other work, this led Metallica to file a lawsuit against Napster for copyright infringement in March of 2000, just one year after Napster was released. Then Dr. Dre would- LimeWire, Emule, Ares, fucking dude. It's quick to follow, also suing Napster a month later. The floodgates were open, and soon enough, Napster was buried in legal challenges and copyright accusations. Although this would soon spell the end for Napster, it didn't dent its short term popularity Kazan. and probably increased its notoriety if anything. I mean, at its peak, Napster had amassed over 18 million registered users. College campuses even had to ban Napster from their internet networks, after Napster's MP3 downloads made up over 60% of college's external network traffic. I Eventually, believe Napster's legal troubles caught up with them and they filed for bankruptcy. But for a brief period of time, Napster had made music a public good. It was freely available Chat. to anyone with a computer. Guys, I'm gonna say it, guys. I was a scum lord, guys. I never seeded my... I never seeded. I would never seed 
Okay, I'm sorry, dude. Computer okay, and internet connection. it is what the it idea is. Of music existing it is what it is. Was a tantalizing idea for many startups, which is why you'd see many similar services prop up out of nowhere. For example, LimeWare and Kazaa were almost carbon copies of one another, offering the same service as Napster and also going down the same way Napster would by being shut down by copyright lawsuit. <laughs> the only seeders out there are people who forgot to turn it off and they're fucking nerds. I'm sorry. It seemed like the model for free instant music was incompatible with a legal successful business. However, one man would end up breaking this mold, which brings us back to Daniel Ek. Daniel prior to founding Spotify was well aware of the dangers, but thought that they would work themselves out. He had seen Napster and all the others picked off one by one, but this didn't phase him. Where some might see adversity, Daniel was seeing opportunity. The technology already existed for something like Spotify, and as streaming and internet connections became faster by the day, it seemed certain that streaming music for free would become a reality. But the real problem here was convincing <laughs> the record labels who held all the legal power over music to allow one of these services to exist. The artists would also need to be cut in, although their take would be far exceeded by the giants of the industry. For Daniel though, these were the problems of the future. The only thing on his mind was the product. So by using the money he'd gained from his early years, as well as some angel investments from his good connections, and Daniel would place all his chips on Spotify. Back then, Spotify was using innovative technology that enabled the client to download songs in bite-sized chunks, rather than the whole songs or albums at one time. Similar to how YouTube works. By designing the app in this way, Spotify reduced buffering substantially and even enabled instant playback for songs on the app. That's in insane. Way, Spotify was already different from Napster, but it still paid homage in other ways. For example, Spotify's original catalogue of music was nearly completely pirated. Spotify hadn't even been released, so there was no way Daniel was going to convince the record labels to let him use a legit catalogue, which put Spotify dangerously close to Napster in the way it did business, although it still lacked peer-to-peer -peer sharing. After months of demanding work from Daniel and a small team of developers, Spotify was released first as a beta test. The blood, sweat, and tears the team Chat. had put into the app was- Guys, I was more simple than that. Chat, I would just go to YouTube, I would download mp3, right? And get a website, copy paste, boom, drag and drop into the folder, put it in my phone or whatever, boom, done. I was a fucking mp3 downloader handy and it, was, it worked pretty well. It was clearly visible because everyone who used Spotify loved its ease of use and lack of buffering. It was an amazing product, but before it was even released, Daniel would find out the harsh truth that it wouldn't ever live up to his idealistic dreams for the music world. Spotify was brought down to earth once Daniel learned what the record label yeah, was yeah, for to license was the music. Yeah. And once he finally convinced the labels to sit down, things didn't go as planned. You see, Ek proposed to the labels that Spotify would be a free app, where all the revenue would be generated from ads. And to yeah. his dismay, the YouTube record labels MP3 were horrified. Instead, the labels demanded a fixed price for each stream of any song or album. Obviously, this solution wouldn't work so a compromise was made. Spotify would still have its free model with ads, but would also offer a monthly subscription in return for no ads and other features. The record labels would take a huge cut of this premium money, as well as from the advertising revenue. Amazingly for Daniel, the deal was struck, and Spotify was now two steps up from Napster. Have you Daniel had seemingly Squid done Row? the impossible. He had put the record labels at bay, and everything was perfect. However, this came with big cost for the app. It would effectively stun the application from its inception. Daniel was horrified to see that lots of the features they had worked on so hard for the free version would be removed placed behind a paywall. For a business that had been about the product from day one, even just releasing Don't was costing X. the company its value principles. Your black but even worse than this was the awful position now. these deals put Thank Spotify into. The benefits of no longer relying on a pirated oh, catalog were up. far outshined by the power that the music industry now I have to go back. I don't know Andy fucking up principles. But even worse than this was the awful position these deals put Spotify into. The benefits of no longer relying on a pirated catalog were far outshined by the power that the music industry now had over Spotify. The big record labels even took a cut of Spotify itself, helping themselves to shares in the company. They had total control of Spotify. So one question remained for Daniel. Was Spotify even worth it? Well, the answer to this was yes. And so Spotify sold out. While this deal did let Spotify survive as a company, avoiding the downfalls of Napster and so many other platforms, this Chat, day, however, also what is it that out of movies, out of all entertainment, what is it that music executives are so fucking greedy and weird and crusty? What is it about music executives? What is it? Changed the platform significantly. Record labels own so much of Spotify now. 
that they have implemented their own changes to the platform. One of these changes is based around playlists. Spotify puts a lot of emphasis on playlists. They're the front and center of the main page. The vast majority of these playlists are algorithmically derived. It's usually impossible to tell whether a human or robot chose the songs. But how does Spotify choose which songs to put in them? Well, the facts are that Spotify doesn't actually choose. The record labels choose. These playlists are a huge part of Spotify, and it's how most people around the world listen to their music. And yet, these playlists are perfectly designed to promote a small group of popular artists which the music industry chooses. Each playlist only includes the music that these record labels want to promote, which leaves independent artists completely excluded from a huge part of the platform. This creation of music eventually became disastrous for small artists, as it makes it almost impossible for them to be seen by the public eye. However, this playlist problem is just a small part of the issue. There are um, numerous similar- uh, uh, I don't know this bad here, oh, but something I don't, I don't, I don't, I hope I don't people know when the big gets mad at this, okay? The reality is, their job isn't to promote small artists and make it discoverable for small artists to grow on their platform. Their goal is to deliver the product to the user and the product who is more likely to be consumed and consumed again to keep the user in the loop, not to give them some indie shit. That, I'm sorry, that's just, that is the business model. Be seen by the public heart. Not their job to promote indie music, even though I agree and I, I go indie music, I love that. And all power to them, well... However, this playlist problem is just a small part of the issue. There are numerous similar systems all working to promote the record label's interests at the expense of a level playing field. From the browse system to the homepage to even the search function, Spotify has given the record labels the power to create people's music. Not only does it directly cause a homogenized corporate musical landscape on the site, it also directly funnels listeners towards certain large record labels' music. This mechanism gives the labels an even larger share of the profits that they already get, because record labels get shares in Spotify Spotify, part of the profits, lots of royalties from streams, oh. and then direct curation of the platform. But what's left for the artists, for the people who actually make that's the music? Kind of, that's kind of well, dumb. Each stream gives an artist just $0.0033, an absolutely minuscule amount. This effectively means that you need a giant audience to make even small amounts of money from Spotify. I mean, most artists have to rely on constant touring to stay afloat, a prospect that was made even worse by the pandemic. And as the big record labels increase their control over Spotify, they're able to squeeze even more money from the platform. This money inevitably has to come from other groups' shares, with the artists taking the hardest hit to their bottom line. It's therefore no wonder the artists have the shares, with the artists taking taking the hardest hit to their bottom line. It's therefore no wonder that artists have vocally protested and boycotted Spotify numerous times over its lifespan. Now, one of the most recent boycotts was done by Neil Young. And while, yes, this had to do a lot with Joe Rogan and his naughty words, it was also about Spotify's business model and the minuscule amount of royalties being paid to artists. And Neil Young wasn't the first. From Taylor Swift to the Beatles, lots of huge artists have tried to resist Spotify's dominance over the music industry. And yet, despite this, all the artists that tried to boycott Spotify are now back on the platform. Even Neil Young, who was protesting Spotify just months ago, has now quietly rejoined the platform. Unsatisfied with the power that Spotify's launch deal gave them, various giants of the music industry have used big mouths with no spine. It is what it is. Spotify's relative weakness. This has come in the form of mountains of legal challenges, not unlike those faced by Napster. And Spotify has only managed to weather the storm because of their insider status. For example, Wixom Music Publishing sued Spotify in 2018. Oh, not me. Changing on the rights of. No way. I have a spine. It's crooked, but I got a spine. The artist. It's just. The artist such it's all crooked. So. This was only one record label, and they sued Spotify for one point six billion dollars. Spotify settled for an undisclosed amount, which clearly shows how Spotify is at the mercy of these companies. And despite striking deals that are ludicrously lucrative for them, the record labels always want more. Of course, all these lawsuits are disguised as being for the artist benefits. But then, who are these mysterious people? Who are these greedy, ruthless companies demanding more and more? What's really under understand the problem with Spotify, we need to have a closer look at who's pulling the strings. Oh no! See, back in 2015, Spotify sought to secure another $500 million of investments to delay going public, all because of the looming threats of lawsuits. Usually when companies do this, they refer themselves to a third party that can broker a deal with other investors. <laughs> Spotify did this because they needed money, they desperately needed investors. And one of the main investors that would poison Spotify for years to come was Goldman Sachs.
But before we continue, I want to talk to you about the video sponsor, Dean, because Spotify needed money badly. Which seems strange because at the same time, Spotify was growing exponentially. In 2011, Spotify reported a client base of 1 million paying customers across Europe in March 2011. And by September 2011, that number was 2 million. Then in June 2015, this number was 75 million users. Spotify's growth was unprecedented, and Daniel Jesus. Ecker had achieved the impossible. By this point, Spotify was a household name. However, there was one issue. With its huge international presence, everyone wanted a piece of Spotify. Lawsuits, ruthless competition from Apple Music, an artist threatening the platform completely, along with extra server costs, and Spotify needed money fast. They had to have power over the record labels. They needed to pay off all the lawsuits and defend the company from its ruthless competition. <clears throat> and to have the funds- I would you get a, a video about, like, it was very in-depth in all the numbers and the shit about the deals that they, that they strike between the companies and executives or whatever the fuck with Spotify itself, I feel like. They'd be kind of crazy. Do this. Spotify needed big investments quick, and who better to provide these investments than Goldman Sachs? Now, who's Goldman Sachs? Of course, Sachs? confidential. Well, I just mean, Sachs is yeah, infamous but for all if, the wrong reasons. Most notably, in 2007, Goldman Sachs shorted millions of dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities uh, for a huge profit that caused millions of families to go broke and wrecked the global economy for years. 1.7 percent here, a loss of 37 points or so. Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between three and four and a half percent generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere, essentially, down by four, five percent. And then when the public went broke and the entire world economy collapsed, the government gave Goldman Sachs an extra $10 billion to keep this company happy. This was just one example of many that highlighted the insane power Goldman Sachs has over the world. But their power doesn't just extend to the US. Oh, Goldman where? Goldman Sachs is also credited with the destruction of the Greek government by masking the national debt the country had been accruing from 1998 to 2009. This in turn caused the 2010 EU sovereign debt crisis, which, long story short, helped end several EU national governments, namely Ireland, Portugal, Italy and France, among several others. With many of these countries going broke and then having to be bailed out by Goldman Sachs in return for power. Because of this reliance, Goldman Sachs oftentimes dictates economic policies in these countries, similar to how they control the companies reliant upon them. Companies like Spotify. You see, the deal between Goldman Sachs and Spotify seemed perfect for Spotify at the time, just like it seemed perfect for EU governments going broke. This 2018 deal was that Goldman Sachs would use their partner's seed money to grow Spotify, and in return, Goldman Sachs would have big shares in the company, or at least that's what they wanted Spotify to think. The true value for Goldman Sachs would later become more apparent in future years. But bear with me, we'll mm -hmm. get onto that soon. Okay, so then who did Goldman Sachs pick to invest in Spotify? Well, naturally, more members of their banking aristocracy. Goldman Sachs offered to help Spotify secure $500 million in investments, with most of these investments coming from monopoly venture capital firms such as Technology Crossover Ventures, or TCV for short. For a long time, TCV if you go <clears throat> sex champ, champ, if the company is rolling, anything is up and crazy, and they, they're making a lot of money through paying customers, it's not even a valuation that they can sell, right, to VCs or whatever, right? They, they have paying customers, right? Why are they going for VC money? I don't, I don't get that. Well, most of the time, people get VC money, whatever the fuck, right? Whenever the, the company has high valuations, or whatever, and they're going great, or whatever, and they need, they need to grow the company, and it's not, not profitable, right? They're, they're losing money. And whatever, the, whatever the fuck. But this is not what I want to say about this. They're making money because it's already a paid service, and they're going hard. Why did, why did they need to liquidate it? They're fucking. They make profit. How the fuck not? How? How not? $100 million in investments, with most of these investments coming from monopoly venture capital firms such as Technology Crossover Ventures, or TCV for short. For a long time, TCV and Goldman Sachs have worked hand-in-hand -hand to control all of our societal media. It's why they work together to dominate the current online landscape. They have massive control over Airbnb, ByteDance, <clears throat> Facebook, Netflix, and Zillow. All of these companies are heavy- It's so dumb! Okay, they have big- they, they, they have big record levels to fucking pay or whatever the fuck, right? Motherfucking- the companies, right? I don't get it! So, so these motherfuckers, the company are going, hey, give us, give us some money. We have, you have, you have our music, but we can't pay for the servers. Who cares? Give my share. And so they have to get investor money to get the side of flow. You know, these motherfuckers are coming in and they're just yoinking all the juice. They're all the juice and they, these guys getting paid for the servers. And they have to get VC. How does that make sense? 
heavily invested by these two. Okay, but what's the big deal? I mean, Goldman Sachs is responsible for international government collapse and the destruction of the American housing market, but we're talking about Spotify. Well, Goldman Sachs is seeking to capitalize on the streaming future of music. It's capitalism. Goldman Sachs has been Bitch, if you want to juice my nuts, man, pay for them. Man. Pay for the sack if you want to fucking juice the nuts, man. I don't, it's an answer more. If you want to get the juice out, out of the fucking balls, I mean, they have to, they, don't they have to fucking maintain the structure? I don't get it. In creating its own homogeny of music streaming services, it does this so it can profit from you by harvesting user data, partnering with established music industry titans, and profiteering from advertisements. It was by making these deals with Goldman Sachs that Spotify so guaranteed itself to fall down a dark path, which will be explained shortly. But Goldman Sachs wasn't the only one. JP Morgan was also doing the exact same thing. And both these giant banking companies have extremely questionable ethics, and the consequences of this are becoming apparent with Spotify. At first, the real main consequence was just from others knowing about Goldman Sachs' investment in the first place. Because once Spotify had received additional investment from investors, the record labels would then try to pocket more shares for themselves, despite Spotify still being unprofitable. While at the same time, chat, musicians- Chat, why do people who do stocks, okay, despite are dressed like they're going to the fucking moon? I never understood this, guys. People who go there and do the stocks in the morning have these suits with like, like, like sponsors look- USA staple like they are fucking going to the moon bro you're changing numbers on the computer man what the fuck is that dude like it's like it's a NASCAR driver bro what is Spotify this? still being unprofitable, while at the same time the musicians on Spotify were hitting back at the company for their laughable revenue sharing with their artists. And these weren't just small artists. These artists included the greats like Pink Floyd and the Beatles, among many, many others. But investors didn't care about that. They understood that Spotify had such leverage over the music world that all bands would eventually have to crawl back to Spotify or choose to make less money. <laughs> because the truth was, Spotify was extremely popular now, with this growth then being accelerated after Spotify quickly struck an agreement with Facebook to incorporate Spotify on their platform. This was then followed by other Spotify bundles, tons of marketing, and the word of mouth from this quick free instant music app. With a simple user design, cheap costs, and massive catalog of music, and Spotify was unstoppable. Yet despite its popularity, the site still wasn't breaking even, and time was ticking before investors would start to raise some eyebrows over Spotify's long-term future. $10 a month, with some premiums and shit, they have 75 million users all sucking that juice up and they can't break a fucking profit, including VC. I don't even, how the fuck does that make sense, man? It was becoming very clear that Spotify could no longer just rely on ads and its premium subscriptions. Instead, to gain more power, trust, and revenue, Spotify needed better cash streams. Spotify's first and most effective cash stream would be to create their own musical hits and be become the most successful record label. This would then give Spotify more leverage and power over the record labels, whilst also generating more revenue for the app. To do this, Spotify would invest all of its money into AI technology. Now, what? this AI technology was great for many users. It provided users many songs that they would never have heard before. However, by Spotify using more AI technology, Spotify could make their own songs go viral and promote them to the top of the music industry. This would then be a major threat to the record labels and would assert Spotify's control of the music industry. While at the same time, yeah. Spotify can then yeah, set- Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I get what he means. He means that like, if they make their own songs and their own affiliations, right? They can fix the AI and shit and bias the fucking system. So if people go to these things and their labels, then it, it pushes the, um, the, the, the amounts the, the, of the revenue that goes to the, 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 the big labels a little bit away and a bit more to that. That's what he's trying to say, right? But I don't think that's, that's realistic at all. Entered their competition, with Spotify already banning songs and artists for hate speech and their own personal controversies. By doing this, Spotify has free reign to pick who becomes popular and who doesn't. And this AI technology is becoming extremely advanced, where this AI takes popular song lyrics from the past and changes the words and vocals to match AI-generated drum beats. Using deep neural networks, uh, Ava looks for patterns in this course, and from a couple of bars of existing music, it actually tries to infer what notes should come next in those tracks. 
And once uh, Ava gets good at those predictions, it can actually uh, build a set of mathematical rules uh, for that style of music in order to create its own original compositions. In fact, CEO Daniel Ek is positioning himself to be on top of the AI industry, with Daniel Ek announcing that his investment what? company, Prima Materia, was going to be donating $150 million to a military defense contractor named Helsing, a military contractor that also specializes in artificial intelligence. Helsing is, in their own words, a new type of artificial intelligence company focused on defense and security. Defense may seem a surprising investment for us, but we share how- How do we get from a, find the correct notes on a fucking song to make some cringe compilation dog shit to rockets? Seems conviction that liberal democratic values are worth defending and that artificial intelligence will be an essential capability to keep us safe. And this software is crazy advanced. This is AI that gathers data from multiple sensors and vehicles and systems to help people process complex and diverse information more reliably and act quickly. Using the secrets of this AI technology and Spotify's music could cause a wave in the music industry. However, Spotify won't just be making money through its artificial songs. Spotify is adopting all of the Netflix business model. They won't just create their own music, they're now starting to license their own exclusive content. The biggest example of this was the $100 million deal between Spotify and Joe Rogan. In May of 2020- I mean, Joe Rogan just, he just trolled them. I mean, let's just say it. Joe Rogan absolutely trolled everybody with this one. Example of this was the one hundred uh, million he... dollar deal. Mega, mega troll. Between okay. Spotify and Joe Rogan. In May of 2020, Joe Rogan signed a licensing agreement with Spotify to be the exclusive platform for his podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience. Back then, Joe's podcast was a great way to hear about people, niches, and opinions never spoken about before. The long form style podcast gave voices and opinions that the mainstream ignored, with Joe Rogan's popularity Why? inching every year. Because it gets a lot of views overall, right? But 100 mil is pretty crazy, right? Podcast would then be littered with celebrity appearances, which skyrocketed his show to new heights. And by 2017, it's a little Joe Rogan was the number one international podcaster. And yet, Joe Rogan's show was completely free on YouTube. With such a loyal fan base, this was the perfect content to bring in new users to Spotify. I don't know, like, what you guys think. Like, you guys, you guys, I'm not a big numbers guy. Okay, Just don't get mad at me. But I mean, it was pulling views, but like to 100 mil, like it's not. It's not crazy. With such a loyal fan base, this was the perfect content to bring in new users to Spotify. And so in 2021, Joe Rogan received $100 million to make a show for Spotify members only. However, with these big investors breathing down Spotify's neck, it would mean that Joe Rogan, a man known for his freedom-loving libertarian roots, would be forced into self-censorship. Since Joe Rogan moved to Spotify, his show has openly been censored on the platform. Huh? With Spotify's team reviewing thousands of his podcasts to remove all content that didn't fit their investors' beliefs. Or more importantly, <laughs> what increases Spotify's ESG score? Which is why the company oh! would have to remove 75 Joe Rogan podcasts. But because Spotify was so desperate for their investors, they couldn't handle lowering Spotify's special ESG rating score. Little did they know, Joe Rogan would be hit by a cancel culture wave. In October 2021, Joe Rogan had a conversation with CNN's in-house medical advisor, Sanjay Gupta. Because a few days prior, Rogan had contracted COVID-19 and was prescribed ivermectin. A CNN report would later air shortly after Rogan's Instagram post regarding his medical condition and condemning Rogan for taking and promoting a horse dewormer. One of those drugs he mentioned, ivermectin, is something more often used to deworm horses. As such, Rogan condemned Gupta of lying for his news company and misrepresenting medical options for those with COVID-19. Joe Rogan then also added that he believed that vaccination should be optional. Because of this, Joe Rogan would obviously be lampooned by the mainstream media, frequently accused of spreading false information, with all of this heat coming to a clash on December 13th. Wait, what? Means for card, what, all them weekend NFL that means for cards prices, cards of what? Frequently accused of spreading false information, with all of this heat coming to a clash on December 30th, when Joe Rogan would have an interview with Dr. The cards. Malone. On this episode, Dr. Malone, one of the developers of the mRNA vaccines, would go on to compare the lockdown mask mandates and mandatory vaccinations as mass formation psychosis. As the clips of this portion of Rogan's podcast surfaced on YouTube, a real mass psychosis occurred, and many wanted to have Rogan burned at the stake. With Rogan being demonized as a menace to public health, and an open letter was sent to Spotify signed by 270 US healthcare officials asking for the platform to censor Rogan's podcast. Podcast. Then following this scandal, boomer corporate rock icon Neil Young threatened Spotify if they didn't remove the Joe Rogan experience from the platform. If they didn't remove his content, he would remove his music. And so in January 2022, he actually did, along with other boomer- Guys, who the fuck is that guy? 
And why would Spotify care that this guy is taking out his music? Artists such as Bruce Springsteen. Even though these artists would eventually crawl back, Spotify would go on to censor episodes and add content advisory panels to all content discussing these controversies. Yeah, it's like, it's like if there's a problem with Twitch. Fucking E Rob. What the Twitch said. Bro, fix this shit or I'm out, bro. Or I'm packing my bags. Uh, okay, okay. Special topics. Or in other words, if Spotify actually did allow freedom of content on the platform, then investors would give Spotify a bad investment score, meaning that current and new investors would be more likely to pull out of Spotify and put Spotify on the verge of bankruptcy. But while licensing and making their own content was one way of making money, it still wasn't enough for Spotify to retain its dominance. Instead, the real money for Spotify came, like with all social media apps, from selling user data. We can see this in the book Spotify Teardown Inside the Black Box of Streaming Music. It was a book written by a group of five academics who spent years studying the service. Spotify, they argue, exists at the confluence of industries such as music, advertising technology, and finance, rather than just being an independent player with the potential to shape the future of the music business. In the book, they describe how by using your emotions, playlists, and in-app behavior, Spotify sells your emotional responses data to advertisers, meaning the albums you listen to could very well be chosen to be a gateway for sales across other industries. And in order to keep harvesting this data, Spotify's AI algorithms work to addict you to the app for as long as possible. This is done through Discover Weekly, Release Radar, and Daily Mixes, which are all based on personal you know listening what? habits. You know what? You know what? This is done through Discover Weekly, Release Radar, and Daily Mix. I think these are all good products though. Because <clears throat> I don't want to use about this because I feel like this gets good data for me. Right? And it, it's using it to enhance my experience. And if the consequence of that is I spend more time on, on, the, on, the, on the app, well, so fucking be it. I don't give a shit. It gives me a better product, which in, in turn makes me uh, feel like I spent, I'm getting more out of the money that I spent on, on the app, whatever. Right? So I'm happy. I don't really see a problem with that. Mixes, which are all based on personal listening habits, which self reinforce the care. more you stay in then your lane. Curated playlists they add tend to be happy because the more you listen to cheery, happy music, the more likely you are to remain listening on the app. And by listening more on the app, oh, the more whoa, time whoa. they have to extract well, well, data. One well, last thing, okay, chat, when I downloaded uh, Spotify, okay, I used, to, I used to listen to like EDM shit at the time, okay, and I used to like like discover new music. So what I did is I listened to like a like hundred songs that I like a lot and I like them. After that, my Discovery Weekly was a fucking bomb. It was full of like underrated, unknown artists with like insane like drum and bass, future bass, fucking uh, a, a deep house, bunch of crazy shit. I was like, holy fuck, man, this is actually insane. And I ended up being a, beginning a bunch of it, man. Data. And by trying to make money this way, it's fire. Spotify's business model has moved away from streaming and into data harvesting. So what sort of data is Spotify actually collecting from you? Well, just think about your first breakup. Do you remember the deep pain you felt? What did you do? Well, for a while, you may have listened to a few songs repeatedly to make yourself feel better and cope with your pain. And by doing this, you taught an algorithm and artificial intelligence something about how humans, namely yourself, manage your emotional trauma through music. From the minute you open the app, Spotify is tracking how you interact with it, from touches and taps to playlist creation to music discovery and artist creation. I, I disagree. This is how the app really makes its money. And all this behavior you're feeding the algorithm isn't the only thing it's tracking either. A quick foray into their privacy policy is chilling. Imagine all the conscious decisions you've made in the app to pick a song, and then combine that with the location data, social media contacts, speakers, and IP addresses, and Spotify starts to have a very clear picture of the global population's psyche. The way Spotify makes money is a sinister omen for our future society. A world where every emotion we feel, love, jealousy, hate, ambition, calmness, is all being fed well, the problem in this? into a giant AI machine that cuts up and sells your emotions to the highest bidder. A world where media, music, and content creation is monopolized under the control of mega banks and their investors. And with the creeping rise of the metaverse and the change in technological landscape, it's almost a certainty that these things will be the new norm. However, it does seem that for Spotify to exist, for us to have any streaming service with an amazing array of music, Spotify has to ride the wave of this current societal trend. Perhaps the only way for big tech businesses to survive anymore is to capitulate to the demands of corporate overlords that leech the creativity of groundbreaking ideas. And if that's the case, I guess we can rejoice at the small victories. The victories of a big tech platform like Spotify keeping up quote controversial topics no matter the noise of the mob. But are we really at a point where we have to feel grateful for only minor censorship? Are we really at a point now where our emotions being sold into a giant Giant yeah, yeah. AI power technology is worth it to give the big labels even more money. A world where everything we think 
feel is more than that one goes so hard. And will this sort of behavior eventually bring a backlash against big tech? Hopefully, this will be a new trend. A trend where we regain control of our emotions, impulses, freedom, and the Straight heat, of our man. Brains. I enjoyed it. I mean, eh. I have a problem with this guy. He's a bit of a doomer. So his videos are good and informative. Whenever he gets into the, like the, um, I think I feel like he makes a bad job at making uh, me understand what the problem is in something. So he'll say, he'll say a bunch of shit, a bunch of things that are like, "Ooh, they have this and they have that." I'm like, okay, cool. Show me why that's a bad thing, and then maybe I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll with it. I just wish you'd explain it. That's all.